question. How is a smooth transition? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, some of you who uh, might know me know that I'm originally from New York, and Washington Irving is probably one of the most famous early writers to emerge from New York, and a lot of his stories, especially The Legend of Sleepy Hollow that most people are familiar with, are actually set in upstate New York. And in selecting the story that I'm going to read to you tonight, um, what most of you probably don't know is just like Sleepy Hollow is a real place in upstate New York, and Salem is a real place in Massachusetts, that Washington Irving didn't really make up these stories. He actually collected stories that he heard from other people that were actually true stories. Now, I know that some of this might be a little bit far-fetched to believe, but in 1849, he wrote this letter. The following adventure was related to me by the same nervous gentleman who told me the romantic tale of the stout gentleman, published in Gracebridge Hall. It is very singular that, although I expressly stated that story to have been told to me and described the very person who told it, still it has been received as an adventure that happened to myself. Now I protest I never met with any adventure of that kind. I should not have grieved at this had it not been intimidated by the author of Waverly in an introduction to his novel Peveril of the Peak, that he was himself the stout gentleman alluded to. I have ever since been importuned by questions and letters from gentlemen, and particularly from ladies, without number, touching what I had seen of the great unknown. Now, all this is extremely tantalizing. It is like being congratulated on the high prize when one has drawn a blank. For I have just as great a desire as any one of the public to penetrate the mis mystery of that very singular personage whose voice fills the very corners of the world without anyone being able to tell whence it comes. My friend, the nervous gentleman, also, who is a man of very shy, retired habits, complains that he has been excessively annoyed in consequence of its getting about in his neighborhood that he is the fortunate personage, insomuch that he has become a character of considerable notoriety in two or three count country towns, he has been repeatedly teased to exhibit himself at blue stocking parties for no other reason than that of being the gentleman who has had a glimpse of the author of Waverly. Indeed, the poor man has grown 10 times as nervous as ever since he was discovered on such good authority to the stout who the stout gentleman was, and will never forgive himself for not having made a more resolute effort to get a full sight of him. He has anxiously endeavored to call up a collection of what he saw of that courtly personage, and has ever since kept a curious eye on all gentlemen of more than ordinary dimensions, whom he has seen getting into stage coaches, excuse me, all in vain. The features he had caught a glimpse of seemed common to the whole race of stout gentlemen, and the great unknown remains as great and unknown as ever. Having premised these circumstances, I will now let the nervous gentleman proceed with his story. So this, basically, Washington Irving, Irving had already relayed a story that he had heard from this other person, and who he refers to as the nervous gentleman. And what I'm going to read to you now is another story that the nervous gentleman retold to Washington Irving. <coughs> Just a moment to catch my breath. Washington Irving refers to this as the adventure of the German student. 
on a stormy night in the tempestuous times of the French Revolution, a young German was returning to his lodgings at a late hour across the old parts of Paris. The lightning gleamed and the loud daps of thunder rattled through the lofty narrow streets. But I should first tell you something about this young German. Gottfried Wolfgang was a young man of good family. He had studied for some time at Göttingen, but being of a visionary and enthusiastic character, he had wandered into those wild and speculative doctrines which have so often bewildered German students. He secluded his secluded life, his intense application, and the singular nature of his studies had an effect on both body and mind. His health was impaired, his imagination diseased. He had been indulging in fanciful speculations on spiritual essences until, like Swedenborg, he had an ideal world of his own around him. He took up a notion, I do not know from what cause, that there was an evil influence hanging over him, an evil genius or a spirit seeking to ensnare him and ensure his perdition. Such an idea, working on his melancholy temperament, produced the most gloomy effects. He became haggard and despondent. His friends discovered the mental malady preying upon him and determined that the best cure was a change of scene. He was sent, therefore, to finish his studies amidst the splendors and gaieties of Paris. Wolfgang arrived at Paris at the breakout of the revolution. The popular delirium had first caught his enthusiastic mind, and he was captivated by the political and the philosophical theories of the day. But the scenes of blood which followed shocked his sensitive nature. It disgusted him with society and the world and made him more than ever a recluse. He shut himself up in the solitary apartment in the paid Latin, the quarter for students. There, in a gloomy street, not far from the monastic walls of the Sorbonne, he pursued his favorite speculations. Sometimes he spent hours together in the great libraries of Paris, those <coughs> catacombs of departed authors rummaging among their hordes of dusty and obsolete works in quest for food for his unhealthy appetite. He was, in a manner, a literary ghoul, feeding in the charnel house of decayed literature. Wolfgang, though solitary and recluse, was of an ardent temperament, but for a time it operated merely upon his imagination. He was too shy and ignorant of the world to make any advance to the fair, but he was a passionate admirer of the female beauty, and in his lonely chamber, he would often lose himself in reveries on forms and faces which he had seen, and his fancy would deck out images of loveliness far surpassing the reality. While his mind was in, his ex in this excited and sublimated state, a dream produced an extraordinary effect on him. It was of a female face of transcendent beauty. So strong was the impression made that he dreamt of it again and again. It haunted his thoughts during the day, and it, and it haunted his slumbers by night. He became passionately enamored of this shadow of a dream. This lasted so long that it became one of those fixed ideas which haunt the minds of melancholy men and are at times mistaken for madness. Such was Gottfried Wolfgang and such his situation at the time I mentioned. He was returning home late one stormy night, it's always a stormy night, <laughs> through some of the old and gloomy streets of the Marais, the ancient parts of Paris. A loud clap of thunder rattled among the high houses of the narrow streets. He came to the Place de Grève, which means the square of strikes, though I think the place of grieving would be more apt. The square, 
where the public executions were performed. The lightning quivered about the pinnacles of the Hotel de Ville and shed flickering gleams over the open space in front. As Wolfgang crossed the square, he shrank back in horror at finding himself close to the guillotine. It was the height of the reign of terror when this dreadful instrument of death stood ever at the ready, and its scalpel was continually running with the blood of the virtuous and the, blood, uh, and the brave. He had that very day been actively employed in the work of carnage, and there it stood in grim array amidst the silent and sleeping city, waiting for fresh victims. Wolfgang's heart sickened within, and he was turning, shuddering from the horrible engine when he beheld a shadowy form, cowering, as it were, at the foot of the steps which led to the scaffold. A succession of vivid flashes of lightning revealed the shape more distinctly. It was a female figure, dressed in black. She was seated on one of the lower steps of the scaffold, leaning forward, her face hid in her lap, and her long, disheveled tresses hanging to the ground, streaming with the rain which fell in torrents. Wolfgang paused. There was something awful in this solitary monument of woe. The female had the appearance of being above the common order. He knew that the times were full of reversals of fortune, and that many a fair head, which had once pillowed on down, now wandered homeless. Perhaps this was some poor mourner whom the dreadful axe had rendered desolate, and who sat here broken-hearted on the strand of existence, from which all that was dear to her had been launched into eternity. He approached, and he addressed her in accents of sympathy. She raised her head and gazed wildly at him. What was his astonishment at beholding, by the bright glare of the lightning that flashed, the very face which had haunted his dreams? It was pale and disconsolate but ravishingly beautiful. Trembling with violence and conflicting emotions, Wolfgang again accosted her. He spoke something of her being exposed that night at such an hour to the fury of such a storm and offered to conduct her to her friends. She pointed to the guillotine with a gesture of dreadful significance. I have no friend on earth, she said. But you have a home, said Wolfgang. Yes, in the grave. The heart of the student melted at those words. If a stranger dare make an offer, he said, with, without danger of being misunderstood, I would offer my humble dwelling as shelter, myself as a devoted friend. I am friendless myself in Paris, and I'm a stranger in a strange land. But if my life could be of service, it is at your disposal, and should be sacrificed before harm or indignity should come to you. There was an honest earnestness in the man's manner that had its effect. His foreign accent, too, was in his favor. It showed him not to be a hackneyed inhabitant of Paris. Indeed, there was an eloquence of true enthusiasm that was not to be doubted. The homeless stranger confided herself implicitly <laughs> to the protection of the student. He supported her faltering steps across the new bridge and by the place where the statue of Henry IV had been overthrown by the populace. The <laughs> storm had abated, and the thunder rumbled only at a distance. All Paris was quiet. That great volcano of human passion slumbered for a while. No gap, oh, I'm sorry, slumbered for a while to gather fresh strength for the next day's eruption. The student conducted his charge through the ancient streets of Paris and by the dusky walls of the Sorbonne to the great dingy hotel which he inhabited. The old portress who admired them stared with surprise at the unusual sight 
of the usually melancholy Wolfgang with a female companion. On entering his apartment, the student, for the first time, blushed at the scantiness and indifference of his dwelling. He had but one chamber, an old-fashioned salon, heavily carved and fantastically furnished with the remains of former magnificence, for it was once one of those hotels in the quarter of Luxembourg Palace which had belonged to nobility. It was lumbered with books and papers, all the usual apparatus of a student, and its bed stood in a recess at one end. When lights were brought on and Wolfgang had a better opportunity of contemplating the stranger, he was more than ever intoxicated by her beauty. Her face was pale, but of a dazzling fairness, set off by a profusion of raven hair that hung clustering about it. Her eyes were large and brilliant, with a singular expression approaching almost wildness. As far as her black dress permitted her shape to be seen, it was of perfect symmetry. Her whole appearance was highly striking, though she was dressed in the simplest style. The only thing approaching to ornament which she wore was a broad band around her neck, clasped by diamonds. The perplexity now commenced with the student how to dispose of this helpless being thus thrown upon his protection. He thought of abandoning his chamber to her and seeking shelter for himself somewhere else. Still, he was so fascinated by her charms, there seemed to be a spell upon his thoughts and his senses that he could not tear himself from her presence. Her manner, too, was singular and unaccountable. She spoke no more of the guillotine. Her, her grief had abated. The attentions of the student at first won her confidence, and now, apparently, her heart. She was evidently an enthusiast, like himself, an enthusiast soon understood each other. In the infatuation of the moment, Wolfgang avowed his passion for her. He told her the story of his mysterious dream and how he, I'm sorry, and how she had possessed his heart before he had even seen her. She was strangely affected by this recital and acknowledged to have felt an impulse towards him equally unaccountable. It was the time for wild theory and wild actions. Old prejudices and superstitions were done away. Everything was under the sway of the goddess of reason, among other rubbish of the old times, were the forms and ceremonies of marriage. They were considered superfluous bonds for honorable minds. Social compacts were in vogue. Wolfgang was too much of a theory, the, theorist not to be tainted by such liberal thinking of his day. Why should we separate, said he, our hearts are united. In the eye of reason and honor, we are as one. What need is there for sordid forms to bind such high souls together? The stranger listened with emotion. She had evidently received illumination at the same school. You have no home nor family, he continued. Let me be everything to you. Or rather, let us be everything to each other. If form is necessary, form shall be observed. Here is my hand. I pledge myself to you forever. Forever, the stranger said solemnly. Forever, repeated Wolfgang. The stranger clasped the hand extended to her. Then I am yours, she murmured, and she sank upon his bosom. The next morning, the student left his bride sleeping and sallied forth to an early hour I'm sorry, at an early hour to seek more spacious apartments, suitable to the change in his situation. When he returned, he found the stranger lying with her head hanging over the bed, one arm thrown over it. He spoke to her, but received no reply. He advanced to waken her from her uneasy posture. On taking his hand, her hand, it was cold. There was no pulse. Her face was pallid and ghastly. In a word, she was a corpse. Horrified and frantic, he alarmed the house. The scene, a scene of, in, of confusion ensued. The police were summoned. An officer of the police entered the room. He started back upon beholding the corpse. Great heaven, he cried. 
How did this woman come here? Do you know anything about her? Asked Wolfgang. Do I? Exclaimed the police officer. She was guillotined this morning. <laughs> he stepped forward, undid the black collar around the next neck of her corpse, and her head rolled onto the floor. <laughs> the student burst into a frenzy. A fiend, a fiend has gained possession of me. I am lost forever. They tried to soothe him, but in vain. He was possessed with a frightful belief that an evil spirit had reanimated the dead body to ensnare him. He went distracted, and he died in a madhouse. Here, the old nervous gentleman, with a, um, I'm sorry. Here, the old nervous gentleman finished his narrative. And this is really a fact, I asked him. A fact not to be doubted, replied the nervous gentleman. I had it from the best authority. The student himself told me. <laughs> Ooh, 